Well, we'll come to order. We even have a quorum. That's amazing. So welcome to the committee. Um, kind of another version of Child Protection Day here. It's a very important topic. Um, and so we have uh, four bills up. It's my intention to get done with whatever we're doing by 4 o'clock so we can take care of Senator Hayden's bill by then at least. And so um, that's if you can kind of keep all your questions in that time frame, then we'll have ample time for Senator Hayden's uh, final bill today. Senator Dietzik, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, who are your co-authors here? Yeah, Senator Bigham uh, and Isaac, what, do you want to do like no, no, rock, whatever. paper, scissors? You can, no. you can favor her if you want to. I will absolutely <laughs> favor her. Mr. Chair, uh, did you Bingham. want this laid over for possible inclusion? Please, yes. I would make that motion for Senator Dietzik that okay. Senate File 190 be laid over for possible inclusion in your omnibus bill. Maybe we should hear it first, though. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and th um, good afternoon, members. Thank you for hearing Senate File 190. This is a bill authorizing and appropriating funding to Hennepin County to help recruit foster families. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Senator Wicklund, Senator Hayden, and Senator Anderson. The number of foster kids, the number of kids in foster care across Minnesota and especially Hennepin County has skyrocketed since 2016. The need for families of color, families to take LGBT and Q kids, and families to take kids with special needs has grown. Hennepin County has been creative working to place kids in safe, secure homes, and this funding will help improve that outreach so we can find these kids loving homes. With me today to discuss the issue is Hennepin County Commissioner Mike Opat. Thank you, thank you, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Welcome to the committee. Yeah, I know. I, I'm Mike Opat, Hennepin County Commissioner. I always need that reminder, so I appreciate it. Um, we in Hennepin County support this bill and thank Senator Dietzik and the co-authors for all their support. I'll address the specifics of the bill, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about child protection in Hennepin County. You may know that in the past four years, Hennepin County has undertaken a massive reform effort with respect to our child protection system. Like virtually every system across the U.S., reports were dramatically up during the recession years. They doubled in Hennepin County up to 20,000 calls per year in, in 2015. That's 55 calls every day of the year um, um, with people reporting abuse and neglect. Spending did not really increase in that period, partially in, right, in light of the recession, and that also is seen throughout the country. In 2015, with the receipt of the Casey Foundation report, we, re we uh, replied to a call, and act, a call to action unlike anything I've been a part of in my 25 years as a commissioner. A few facts about our response. Upon receiving the report, we formed the Child Protection Oversight Committee, which I chair. It's made up of community members. And then we followed that up with a Child Wellbeing Oversight Committee to make sure we keep a longitudinal eye on our efforts. Since 2015, when we took that action, we have hired more than 175 new staff. That's the largest hiring in two bites, we did it in two years, of anything we've ever done in Hennepin County since I've been there. There, are, there were 470 full-time equivalents in 2015. There are more than 650 now. In 2015, there were $96 million spent total on child protection, $46 million in property tax. In 2019, it's $154 million total and $94 million in property tax. Foster care spending has more than doubled. We are now spending about $27 million on foster care alone. At Hennepin County, we know we are partners with the state to address these concerns, but state funding has not come close to keeping pace with our needs. In fact, Minnesota, as you know, has one of the lowest state investments in child protection in the nation. Our reform efforts include staffing, as I mentioned, expanding child protection to a child well-being practice model to move upstream and focus on early interventions to reduce maltreatment in hope to reduce the need for, for out-of-home placements. We're further committing to kinship care when foster care is needed, and this bill will help us particularly with that. We know there is less trauma and better outcomes with kin placements. In Hennepin County, currently 61% of, of our foster placements are in kinship care. We have seen results. Caseloads are down. Out-of-home placements are declining. I believe word is getting out that everyone has a role to play in helping families under stress. I hope that's true. The bill will help us with foster care. In a recent child well-being meeting, we devoted much of the agenda to foster care and kinship. It seems like an easy proposition. 
but the statute definition of kin includes many more options than the well-known and beloved grandparent. In many cases, there is culture shock with the new foster parents and the new role. There's all kinds of administrative burden. The, re the remuneration is slight, the duties are many. In many cases, um, we will, well, in mo we will use these funds to recruit, train, and assist kinship foster parents. We hope to develop innovative recruitment tools and make the prospect and practice of taking on this incredible responsibility easier. These additional state resources allow Hennepin to work with our community to develop additional foster care placements. We know our system can't support the growing demand and we need to answer it. We're committed to working with community groups that will help us accomplish this goal. And again, we thank Senator Dietzik, the co-authors, and you, Mr. Chairman, for listening to us today. Well, thank you very much. And we had a very similar bill last year, the year before, from a, a county just to the north of you. And it was extremely successful. And, and I'm glad you brought this forward again, because I'm interested in helping uh, your very fine county, but also if there's a way to generalize this to help it happen. So this is, you know, if we just do this this year, it's fine, I suppose, but interesting to find a way to generalize the benefits. Um, Questions for Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Opat. Uh, Anoka County did have a lot of success, and have you talked to them about how they achieved, and will this money be used similarly? I know Anoka is a smaller county than Hennepin, but they, they use the money to really productive ends. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator Benson, I have not talked to Anoka County, but certainly I wasn't really aware of their, of their receiving this money, but we're open to any and all input, so we'll do that. I think that'd be productive, and especially as we try to generalize it, but it's, I mean, people like this idea. It's a good bill. Uh, other questions? All righty. Uh, with that, uh, we'll lay the bill over, and thanks for coming to the committee. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. that very Thank much. You committee. Senator Rosen. And so we're going to be moving Senate File 751 to go to the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. And uh, just for, to the testifiers, um, this is the, the committee that handles the child protection matters. And so there's a lot of interest in the bill on all kinds of levels about how great an idea it is or how bad an idea it is or um, who it's, you know, what is going to happen to the industries touched by this. But we're really here for the section that talks about where the money goes to be spent. And uh, so if you can focus on that, that would be helpful to me. I'm not going to deprive you of your free speech. So Senator Rosen, I notice, um, that your, they say friends, friends come and go, enemies accumulate. You've got a few uh, letters in opposition and some in support. And so um, I guess we're getting somewhere. So <laughs> welcome to the committee and uh, glad you can be here. And so, uh, so Senator Rosen moves her bill to be before us. And so here you are. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Senate file 751 has been a, a long journey. And I, again, uh, stand very proud and honored to, to sit here with my my friend, uh, Senator Eaton, on this journey. And I also have Jennifer DeCabillis from uh, Hennepin County, too, to testify. And as you said, this is about the out-of-home placement um, money that's, that's in the bill. If I could just briefly go over the bill. I had a whole bunch of stuff that I was going to show you. There are some good things in the packet, though, that I'd like to point out. This one form that's uh, the county reporting system for 2018 of out-of-home placement report for each county. Members, you have that. Also, the, here's a list of the quantities dispensed for each of the manufacturers. That's also in your packet. For your leisure reading, um, how the prescription monitoring program is going, how it works now and how it will work once we get it up and rolling with the new um, APRIS marketing tool. And then a little bit of condensed information from Hennepin County. And like I said, we will hear from um, Mr. Dicabellius, I know I'm saying your, your name wrong. That's close. Okay, Dicabellius. So this bill basically addresses this public health emergency that we have before you. I was reading last night. We've already spent in the U.S. 78.5 billion per year on this crisis. Cost of health care, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice oversight included in that. So the increased licensing fee for manufacturers and wholesalers would increase from $235 per year to $5,000 a base licensure. And depending on how much they have been manufacturing and distributing is, uh, will go up accordingly. The goal is to accumulate $20 million from the manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers. 
there's reports that are due um, to the Board of Pharmacy by March 2020. And then they will notify the manufacturer and distributor of the amount that is owed. Then the board will evaluate the fee and report back to the legislature with um, by July 1st of 2023. We do have in this bill results first of $300,000. And I think that's very important to make sure that we are um, adjusting that accordingly. So it does, the bill also creates a opiate, opiate epidemic response advisory council to develop and implement a comprehensive and effective statewide effort focused on prevention and education, treatment, innovation, and capacity building. And the council will review local, state, and federal initiatives, establish priorities in consult with MMB, ensure alignment with federal dollars for the greatest impact, and develop criteria in awarding grants and use the results first. This is an 18-member um, uh, council, and from there, I would like to just talk about what they will be um, working on, and we develop a opioid epidemic response account. It's a special revenue fund starting in 2020. The appropriations from there are 300,000, as I said, for results first, 249,000 for the administration to DHS, and uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Benson, the, the fiscal note is in process and on your way, yes. Uh, 33,000 for the Board of Pharmacy for the collection of the registration free from the providers, 384,000 for the public safety BCA agent drug scientists, and 600, that might have increased actually, uh, for St. Gabriel's and HCMC for the Project ECHO. And the part that is important and in front of this committee is that 50% of the money of this 20 million, so 10 million would go to, um, excuse me, um, Mr. Chair, it's 800,000 for St. Gabriel's and HCMC. We did increase that amount to make sure that currently they are, uh, they are in the red. So we wanna make sure that we're able to sustain them in their efforts. So I increased it up to 80,000. And then the 50% of, and this is on page um, 11.25, at least 50% shall be distributed to county social service agencies to provide child protection services to children and families who are affected by addiction. The commissioner shall distribute this money proportionately to counties based on the number of open child protection case management cases in the county using data from the previous calendar year. And, um, then we go into just some disposal language, and there's uh, general prescription requirements about um, dressing acute pain and uh, dental and the doctors being able to use their professional clinical judgment. Uh, there's some information on um, accessing the data and also some, um, if when the data is being accessed, what it does, the off-ramps and for hospice care, palliative care, uh, prescriptions issued within 14 days following surgery or three days oral surgery. And then there's some funding for the PDMP. We're collecting a $50 per user per year from prescribers and pharmacists. And that will go into a special revenue fund for the board to authorize the vendor. We do have a continuing ed piece, at least two hours of continuing ed, or um, if the prescription the prescribing protocols established under the pro Opioid Prescribing Improvement Program. Um, there is an opioid overdose reduction pilot pro program, which uh, Mr. Chair and members, I think we're gonna take a second look at that. It's a million dollars per year. We're not sure if that's quite the appropriate area to use that money. And then, and then in the very tail end of the bill, the appropriations, one million for the 2020 Opioid Overdo Overdose Reduction Pilot pro Program, which is the community oh. paramedic which I just mentioned, we're gonna take another look at. 150,000 for the statewide inventory of non-narcotic pain management prevention resources. And then we added um, 2 million per year ongoing from the general fund for violent crime enforcement team grants, prioritizing greater Minnesota applicants. That This was put in, this is a, this is a priority for, for me, um, and we put this in in judiciary, because we have to stop the flow that's coming in whether it's synthetic fentanyl, heroin, methamphetamine is being um, introduced, 
on our, our major interstates, and they have been at a stagnant funding since 2011 at 4.3, and these um, undercover, our, our drug force teams need some, some assistance. And then one million general fund for ECHO programs to keep them from going, um, and to keep them going until we can start collecting these fees from the manufacturers. So with that, um, Mr. Chair, I don't know how you'd like to go, but I, I, I do have my testifier here. Mr. And you have an amendment to... Uh, you know, Senator, Mr. Chair, I think... Do you want to move I, that I, or not? No, I'm, I'm going to wait on okay, that. Okay, we'll hold on that. Very good. Yeah. And so um, the, the, uh, the least fleshed out component is the 50% um, the to county social service agencies, which is on line 11.25, 11.29. But I think any discussion of where the money goes is germane to our committee. So I'll just, if, if people can stay in that parameter and... If you came to talk about something else, I apologize, but we have our jurisdiction. So anyway, uh, Commissioner, welcome to the, is that what you are now? You're the director. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, uh, Jennifer DeCubellis, I'm the Deputy County Administrator for Hennepin County. And I appreciate some time to talk about the impact. As public servants, it's very important that we look at both what is right for people in our community and what is fiscally responsible. And we are alarmed by the opioid epidemic and what's happening both to people as well as the fiscal responsibility that we're charged with as public servants. So we're very grateful for Senator Rosen and Senator Eaton for their leadership in, de in delivering real solutions, which is what we believe this bill does. It sets us on a pathway to take better care of people as well as be fiscally responsible. So I'm gonna highlight today just a few uh, data points from Hennepin County that demonstrates why this matter is important. The first thing is it's speaking from the heart. It's we want to and are able to prevent the trauma that's happening to people, and we certainly as a state can do better. And from a fiscal perspective, we know that there are significant dollars being spent on the wrong outcomes for people, and we believe that this bill can help us start turning that around. In Hennepin County, we had 149 deaths last year. That's a three a week on average in just one county in Minnesota. One preventable death is too many, and we need a call to action, and we see this bill as that call to action. It is delivering broken families, the capacity for folks with addiction to work in a time when we need everybody in the workforce, the capacity for families and individuals to be safe. We see what's happening on our streets with individuals who are homeless, and the capacity to parent to provide consistent supervision and caretaking capacity to children, which is part of why the child protection language is in this bill. In child protection, we've doubled the number of child abuse and neglect cases involving opioids since 2009. Nearly all of our cases involving infants are a result of parental drug use. We've seen a 72% increase in out-of-home placement in the past three years, and we know out-of-home placement isn't good for families, and it's certainly not good for children. At the hospital at Hennepin County Medical Center, we used to see six to 12 pregnant women in treatment for opioids a year. We now see that on any given day. In jail, snapshots of time show us that 40% of inmates in jail have active opioid use. And in racial disparities, this epidemic started with white suburban young adults, but we disproportionately see the impact right now with Native Americans and African Americans, which furthers our already alarming disparities across our communities. If I say nothing else today, I want you to hear this is a crisis. The devastating impact to humans, if that's not enough, it's also a fiscal crisis. We can't sustain the demand on government and public programs which are doing the wrong things for people right now. And in Hennepin County, we're speaking to our numbers, but we're not alone. Our health plan is a very small health plan across the state of Minnesota, serving just under 30,000 members. Our health plan spends over $2 million a year for addiction treatment. Our medical examiner's office saw a 31% increase in lab costs for testing for synthetics and had to add two full-time physicians to handle autopsy demands. At over $5,100 on average for the cost of an autopsy, it's been an increase in the medical examiner's costs of over $240,000. Wow. HCMC, Hennepin Healthcare, is treating over 8 
100 babies per year for opioid withdrawal. One day in the NICU is upwards of $2,000 per day, not to mention it's not a healthy start for these infants. Child protection in Hennepin County is costing over $150 million, which has more than doubled our costs since 2013. Out-of-home placement in Hennepin County is costing over $50 million. And as I already mentioned, it's not good for kids, it's not good for families, it's not good for our communities. My list could go on, but the crisis is here and the time for action is now. This bill provides solutions. We need money to invest in these solutions, real solutions, not Band-Aids, so we can save lives, heal families, and keep addiction from advancing through generations. We support this bill. We request you see the urgency to act, and we stand ready to partner. Thanks, Thanks. Mr. Cabellas. And I just, uh, uh, part of my question for you specifically is the way that uh, line 1125 to 29 reads, um, is that um, where it just sends 50% out based upon open child support cases, is that a, is that a good uh, metric for you, in your opinion? and a fair way to spend up to $10 million across the state? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, absolutely. Um, every bit that helps us focus on how do we help, help the adults that are dealing with addiction and how do we help these children get better futures going forward is absolutely instrumental in us taking the right steps forward. So it seemed like it wasn't a bad one, but you think of all the metrics you could think of, that's just a fair one that would get it to where the concentrations are greatest and... That's, that was my question, so thank you. Yes. Senator Bingham. Oh, Senator Hayden is first. Sorry, I just... Uh... Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Rosen and Eaton. This is a long time coming. I know we got a little ways to go yet on this bill, but I do appreciate all of the hard work that you've done. Um, I have maybe one question and then another one just came to mind. Um, on your task force, um, and I was looking at the members of it, and I think that they're all great. I was wondering, based on the historic um, issues that the African American community has had around opioids, and then it's been confirmed by our deputy administrator here in Hennepin County, um, and we, and I don't want to add it today, I don't like to write policy that way, but I guess what I want to say is maybe there could be a member of that community who understands uh, the issues particularly that goes on around opioids, which has been a historic issue uh, with them. Um, just as a side, I had a conversation on community radio and they didn't realize there's an epidemic of pills and other forms of opioids and even it's been kind of highlighted in some music, and they didn't realize that that was opioids, the community members and others that I was talking to. And that made me start to think that there's a disconnect between what we're talking about, you know, what we've highlighted around opioid and, and uh, uh, addiction relative to things like heroin and, and other things that happen in that community. So um, maybe we could talk later, but I would like to talk about if there's a spot from a cultural perspective that they might get a place here to, to help us, to help guide us. And Senator Hayden, you weren't here when I talked about the scope of our work today. Oh. And I'm actually trying to save time for your other bills. Okay, so, okay. Um, and so, <laughs> it's your call. Um, but so, uh, we're really talking about page 11, which is oh. where the money is okay. going, and maybe the end of the bill too. So those, and this is going back to the health committee. So I think a discussion in between here and there makes a lot of sense. Well, Mr. Offline. Chair, with that, I don't have any more questions. All right. um, and I'll just talk to <laughs> Senator answer. Rosen and Eaton offline. And so, um, Mr. Chair. Is Senator Eaton. I would just like to indicate that I have heard Senator Hayden. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. And so um, there's a couple of testifiers. Are there questions for Ms. Cabellas? If there's questions for her, then we'll do those and stick around. Uh, Senator Bigham. Thank no, you. No, just don't leave. So you, you, you get to stay. Sorry. Thank Good you, effort Mr. to sneak out, but it didn't work. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Cabellas. Um, uh, one, uh, I want to draw the committee's attention to the letter from the Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, this is uh, an unbelievable issue for the counties, not only in child protection, and your comments um, highlighted some of them, but what we don't do to offset this epidemic falls on property taxes. And um, Mr. Chair, you aptly talked about how this is focused on child protection. 
Of course, I think they should go to child protection. I think that's the most efficient and effective use of, of this money. And I think it goes from the day the child is born and um, is born uh, dependent on this. And that's when child protection starts in, right at that moment and follows the child through until, um, you know, whether it's through foster family or kinship or um, on and on and on. But it also deals with our jails. It also deals, as you said, with our medical examiners. If anybody has talked to uh, the executive, executive director of the Sheriff's Association, um, they, they'll tell you um, the increase in cases that have occurred due to this epidemic. And um, again, I think this isn't, um, I appreciate the bill. Uh, I am 100% supportive of it and whatever I can do to help. And I appreciate Hennepin um, highlighting a lot of this. This is a statewide issue. And think of the, the, I saw a lot of shock looks on people's faces when they saw, heard some of the statistics. And that's Hennepin. I mean, they call it the state of Hennepin when you're on the county, on the county level. And, uh, and that's a compliment. Um, but there's a lot of other smaller counties that imagine they don't have the resources and the ability and the proximity that Hennepin does to deal with this. Uh, so I would keep that in mind. Um, also, I would say that due to the fact that this has taken so long to get through, um, the counties filed lawsuits on their own uh, to do this. And so that's how big of a deal this is and how much of a financial burden this epidemic is on our counties and our local communities and our property taxes. So I thank so much Senator Rosen and Eaton for your leadership on this um, and helping relieve some of the uh, financial burden uh, that falls onto our property taxes because we are cleaning up a mess that we did not start and the pharmaceutical companies have a responsibility to be part of that solution. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Actually, some of it's all the sovereign state of Hennepin. But anyway, there's, a, there's some other, sorry, there's, there's some other mess. This is the piles of notes we have here. There's another larger pile of supporters and some opponents as well. So, uh, Senator Benson to um, Ms. DeCavillas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, yeah, and thanks. to Ms. DeCavillas. And this might be a question to take to all the counties, but for every $250,000 or million dollars that we put into child protection, how much relief does it provide? How many more? kids do we get taken care of? Um, so some of those metrics so we know what we're actually impacting here and then can have some expectation that this is going to have long-term impact. And it doesn't have to be today, but I'd like to hear it before Ms. Tika we Bills, get maybe the, What if you got a million dollars, what would you do with it? That's a good question. Mr. Chair, members, the, the million dollars, right now, without it, we're not providing that prevention, that early intervention to families and adults to get them better connected to addiction. Um, what we are is we're throwing them into the deep end of the child protection system or the court system or to our emergency departments. So it is to say how do we intervene earlier and smarter in order to provide the supports and wrap those supports around people so that we're not getting them into the deep end system. system. And Mr. Chair, Senator, I'd be happy to work with the associations across the counties in order to get some of that specific data back to you. Is it, Senator Benson. Mr. Chair, a couple of things. We're doing nurse home visiting now, so are we doing a good job working with nurse home visiting to get early into addiction treatment? So I feel like maybe there's a gap there that needs to be at least talked about and we can fix it later. But we get the, the list of all the counties that are impacted and how many cases they have open. And knowing what the $10 million, does it make a dent? Does it solve half the problem? So this is, this is what I'm trying to wrap my head around with the question. So not for today, but I'd appreciate it at Thanks. some point. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Ticabellis, thanks. Now you can escape. And so we have four other witnesses. Um, Ms. Schultz, if you're here. And then on deck is uh, Dr. Pilkus, and then Ms. Elkington, and then Mr. Michelin, if he's a doctor or Mr. whatever. So welcome to the committee. And again, most of our focus is on page 11. So, Correct. And, and so, and if you've, if, if, and just the other testifiers, we're, we, there's been a lot of testimony in this bill and other committees about the merits and the challenges you face. So if you can just, we'll appreciate that. We know that. And so if you can add to the discussion, I would be grateful. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Does Thank that leave you anything to say? Oh, thanks for coming. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kara Schultz and I am a sitting council member in Burnsville. And I was asked to present testimony on behalf of residents who've contacted me. Believe me, Burnsville is on the front line of the heroin and fentanyl crisis. So
So we are very, very aware of this and are struggling to deal with it, as are you. I am also a stage four cancer patient involved with several cancer support groups and would like to relay how this impacts as well. Uh, the first concern, though, is rising costs. Between this bill and its sister bill in the House, we could see a $20 million rise in the cost of prescriptions. Ms. Schultz. I'm getting right to it. Okay. Trust me. Thanks. I'm, I'm dovetailing. Oh, you're in. building a base. I got it. I am. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is being proposed while our Attorney General Keith Ellison is creating a task force to lower prescription drug costs. So when you're looking at ways to finance this, because I do think we do have needed services to help patients, to help families, please do not do this in a way that harms patients. That's what we're asking on that. Um, if we want to talk about costs and costs to the counties, costs to cities, Improperly managed paying costs the United States $636 billion in direct costs every year. I do want to mention a term that is coming up more and more in these conversations. And that term is structural iotrogenesis. Structural iotrogenesis is the causing of clinical harm to patients by bureaucratic systems within medicine, including those intended to benefit them. And this term is being used by researchers looking into the effects of restricting pain medications from patients who need them. And I ask you to consider if what this bill would do is going to cause clinical harm to patients, including those you are intending to help with these funding mechanisms. Two days ago, a member of our group, Carla, died, and she was forced tapered after years of successful pain management. And Two weeks she was to receive a pain, pain pump, which was her only option. And her family told us that her heart attack was caused by rapid force taper and stress of unmanaged pain on her heart. Those are also costs that come to our counties, our state, and our city. Other costs that come, which can be impacted, that we need to be very mindful of, is three weeks ago, Thomas Hauk of Eden Prairie was sentenced after he pled guilty to helping his wife commit suicide. She was forced tapered, she couldn't endure the pain, and he assisted her in helping her end her life. Ms. Schultz, I just have to, if, I'm trying to be generous here, but we have finite time and you really aren't getting to page 11, but if, if there's a way you can do that, I would be grateful, because I know you have some Absolutely. expertise you could share with us. Absolutely. So when we use these, when we're looking at funding mechanisms and we're also looking at how we're spending those funds, I want us to be very mindful that we're not going to um, be taking away from one group to fund another and not having a net gain for our counties and our cities. And that's something that we do need to be very, very mindful of. Thank you. I'm here today because I'm being contacted by residents all over the state. <clears throat> And they're expressing their concerns, both about in getting help and also about concerns about what this and how it can impact them. They're begging me to help them, their parent, their spouse, and their child. And at this point, with everyone contacting me, I'm frankly overwhelmed and I'm at a loss. Mm -hmm. I'm a city councilor Ms. and I don't have the power to help them, but I am asking you yeah. if you can assist them. So please be mindful in how you're directing the funds and where you're getting the funds from. That's good advice. And Ms. Schultz, your, your concerns are not ill-founded. They're just not our topic. So, and so the author is sitting next to you and the, another author, and I'm one of the authors, and members of this committee are going to be active on this bill and other committees as well. So I do respect all your thoughts, and thank you for, I'm glad you're a survivor. Um, Ms. Pilkus, Dr. Pilkus, if you could come down, please. And if, if just a, a few minutes a person, you know, to the topic that we're at, I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk, we just have so much to do here, and trying to find a way to best spend this $10 million. That's really the thank question you. before us, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this group. Um, I'm an addiction medicine physician. I work at Health Partners at Regions in the hospital and, and a pain management clinic, seeing patients with opioid use disorders and chronic pain on a daily basis. I also run my own business. I own an addiction medicine clinic in the South Metro where we serve over 300 patients, most of them with Medicaid and PMAPs. 
I want to talk to you today about how the opioid epidemic is affecting Minnesota, not just in terms of lives or dollars, but in terms of lost potential. 401 people died in Minnesota in 2017 to opioid overdoses. These people were mostly between the ages of 25 and 34. The White House Council of Economic Advisors estimates that, thank you, that those lives will cost the state nearly $5 billion. These drugs cut people down early in life. Their potential is huge. That's 40 years of work, 40 years of taxes, 40 years of raising healthy families. And that's just one death. In the wake of that one death, we get one parent families, we get children in foster care or with grandparents, we get mothers and fathers and siblings with trauma, we get husbands and wives who can't cope. People in the wake of trauma cannot function normally. They can't be productive. So how long does that last? Nobody knows. On top of the 401 deaths, we get countless people that are still addicted to opioids. We know that people with substance use disorders have much higher health care costs. People who have an opioid use disorder are two to three more times more likely to be hospitalized. And 25% of people with an opioid use disorder can expect to be hospitalized in the course of a year. And we all know that rehab isn't cheap. It's also quite difficult to hold down a job and Dr. be addicted Pilkes, to opioids at the same time. Could you, uh, you're an expert in many things. Could you comment upon how you see the child protection world interacting with the people you treat? Yeah. Please, that would be helpful to me. Yeah, in sure. this topic. Thank so, um, how do I see the child protection world interacting? So, um, for the most part, they, um, I mean, I see moms who don't have their kids. And they get them back once they're uh, more stable in their life. And I see people every day that get more stable and get their kids back after they're in treatment. But they um, have usually been in treatment for like six months to a year when they get their kids back. Um, so I see that probably of my moms, I'd say um, probably 15 to 20 percent of them don't have their kids with them or they're fighting over their kids. Um, so does that answer your question? Well, it's, it's helpful because the topic today is kind of about child protection and this sort of fits into that topic. And so yeah. we're, we're just, I'm struggling with how many kids are out of, out of home placement in Beltrami County. One, 12% of the kids are in out-of-home placement and 70% are because of this. And so that's what we're trying to get our arms around. And so yeah. your experiences in that are, are useful. Senator Hayden, did you have a question? Yeah, to, the, to that point, Mr. Chair, and I think that's a great line of questioning. Um, so, um, Doctor, do you, in your kind of professional opinion, because you broached this issue of moms that don't have their children while they're trying to go to treatment or trying to develop some system to get themselves together, if you will, for lack of a better term. Do you think that developing more treatment options that allows moms to go through treatment with their children is something that would work? I think that would be amazing, but that's there's one place that does that in Minnesota, and the lines are months long. Yeah, that would be amazing. So Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen, yeah. to our doctor, I think that that, to, to the point of what we're talking about today, and we have some family first legislation and others that is a different time oh. and place, I do think that that, to, to, Mr. Chair, is something that we should probably continue to think about in Senator Rosen as you are kind of playing out what this group is going to look like and what is, and if we start to spell out specifically what some of those uses are, maybe that's something that we can really hone in on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Elkington and then uh, Mr. Mitchell and maybe you can come up together and, and uh, if you can just spend a couple minutes talking about the topic that we're on, that would be awesome. And welcome back. Hi. And I know this is close I'm to your Shelley heart. I'm Shelly Elkington so. and I can take a hint. <laughs> so there, I, I have God a great, bless you. I, yeah, I know, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I have an incredible story that I'd like to share at another time, but there are some people here that I think could really answer your questions because I get the vibe what you're after, and I think the doctors from Little Falls are here who deal with this directly, and I think they'd be well suited to, to perhaps testify, so I'll withdraw my testimony today. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for coming yeah. down, doctor. <laughs> are you the doctor from Little Falls? No. Oh. Oh. I wish. I prefer that sometimes. I do too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just, so a couple minutes on whatever is on your mind relative to our topic of child protection would be amazing. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. My name is Brett Michelin. I'm with the Association for Accessible Medicines, and AAIM represents the generic and biosimilar uh, bio manufacturers. Its core mission is to improve access and... Uh, Oh, thank you. Oh, and uh, improve access to affordable FDA-approved drugs. And uh, I've recognized your, your comments and uh, <laughs> appreciate them. And I think each time you said something, I scratched another paragraph <laughs> off of my uh, prepared 
testimony, which is just fine because I rarely well, tell am us, able to follow my prepared testimony. How about if you just tell us so. what you're thinking about? I, Absolutely. Prepared comments so, are kind of like pointless sometimes. The, so how do you see recognizing the this focus, issue affecting the child protection system and what would you do about it? That would be helpful. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I appreciate those comments. Um, and quite frankly, AAM's concerns are not, we're not here to question the priorities that Minnesota would spend this money on or um, even the need for the state of Minnesota to spend this money. Our concerns are focused on the fee and that the state of Minnesota may not have the money to spend on these programs. We recognize the steps that Senator Rosen has taken in earlier committees and we appreciate those and, and we think we're moving in a much better direction. But quite frankly, if the fee is not spread amongst the supply chain as we've talked about, the money is quite literally not going to be there from the generic manufacturers that the bill is currently focused on at Got this it. point. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, did you want to talk about the interaction with the child protection system at all? But anyway, <laughs> I appreciate you coming forward. No, just want Thanks. to make sure that the state actually has the money to spend on the programs that it's designing. That's a very good you kind of circled and now we're in for a landing. So thank you very thank much. You very I appreciate much. that. Was there a doctor from Little Falls or somebody wanted to? We're, we're going to run out of time here, but go ahead. If you can take Mr. Uh, Mr. Michelin's spot there and just oh, cast him aside and just throw him. Anyway, thank you for coming. And so. This is, uh, you get to have the last uh, public word here, and then we're going to have a little discussion, and then we're going to move this bill off. So like welcome to the committee. Visit. and I can do that. <laughs> I'm Dr. Heather Bell. I am a family physician in Little Falls, Minnesota. Um, just a little quick background. So I am a doctor in Little Falls who've been prescribing Suboxone for the last three years. We've had a nationally recognized opioid program in Little Falls where we've tapered over half of our patients off of unnecessary pain medications, yada, yada. But the bottom line comes down to the money. You asked what, what I would do with a million dollars, and I'll just tell you what I did with no, a million actually, dollars. The, the question was, what would you do with a million dollars? The, the Not previous, me personally. No, to no, help uh, yeah. <laughs> nice to have a nice trip in the Bahamas. No, the question was to the, she was a director of human services mm -hmm. at Hennepin County, and so if she had a million dollars to put into child protection work, yep. what would she do? Okay. So if you had a million dollars to put into child protection work, what would you do with okay, it. so That's in the, the last question. year in Little Falls, we took a million dollars and we made eight pilot programs throughout our state. In those eight pilot programs, we've added 35 new Suboxone primary care rural doctors prescribing Suboxone who are now taking care of 135 new patients um, on Suboxone. With those 135, we have 100, so that's 235 new patients. I deliver these patients, here's your child protection, I deliver these patients in our critical access hospital in Little Falls on their MAT. Um, the best thing missing from their deliveries is there is no child protection in the room. Um, one of our patients who delivered recently um, didn't present until she was 24 weeks pregnant. They were on board and then I got to say see you later because this mom tested negative at delivery except for her Suboxone. The baby tested negative at delivery except for her Suboxone. So child protection never even got involved. Not only that, but we have gotten patients started on the reservation in Mille Lacs through our pilot program. And they don't do deliveries in the Mille Lacs, but they do OB care. And so those patients are now delivering in Little Falls as well, um, therefore not getting child protection involved. And so with a million dollars, we we kind of just put our social worker and our nurse on the child protection board in Little Falls. I work back and forth because I do deliver babies. Um, and we just tend to like get them involved right away at the beginning of deliveries, get them involved at the beginning of patients entering our programs who have kids in child protection and treat them. Last week, one last thing, last week a patient um, showed up in our ER withdrawing from heroin at 27 weeks pregnant. They called Kurt, Dr. Devine, who's here with me. Um, he met her in the ER, said, yep, she needs meds. I started her on meds. She went to jail. She's currently in our jail, but she's on Suboxone in our jail because we're the first county to do that, is to put, put Suboxone in our jails, start patients on Suboxone in our jails. So she'll get out of jail in the next few days on her Suboxone, go back and deliver you know, a baby who's not on heroin and cocaine and all the other things that she was previously on. So our role with child protection is to try to minimize their involvement in these lives and then work with them to show them when they're in a program like ours, they're not needing all those extra services. And so Dr. Bell, you, had a, you try to work upstream like the rest of the folks can. And, and so unfortunately, a lot of the counties are so besieged by 
by cases, they just don't, they can't get their, their well, right. and, and so you know, this is a really good, this is a very helpful piece of testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you Mr. know, they actually mentioned us in this ECHO thing because um, my partner, Dr. Devine and myself run the largest ECHO arguably in the country on opioids. Um, we had 120 patients, 20 people on today, which is why we we're a little late, because um, we did our ECHO today. And we are in 44 different counties through our ECHO. From Morrison County, we touch 44 other counties as of right now um, is the rough number. And so all these counties are getting mentored by us in how to do this. We give docs and social workers and nurses all across our state our phone numbers, and they call us. We had an ER doc yesterday in Aiken who is not wavered, who started a patient on Suboxone because he called us and had us walk him through how to do this. So this is possible, and it doesn't, I mean, it took a million dollars, but we've done a ton with it. Oh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let's give them more than a million. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's give what? So, uh, Can I so, breathe? So Morrison County gets the award for the most innovative county of the day. So thank well, you thank very you. much. Well, thank you. And, yeah. and that's Did you check awesome. out BuzzFeed? No. We're trying to wrap this <laughs> that up. That was on Monday. Time, so <laughs> Senator Hayden, you get 10 seconds. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and to our test the doctor. What is, what, are there any adverse uh, reactions to, to babies? Uh, or in, in utero, if you will, or whatever I'm trying to say, doctor. I um, get it. <laughs> uh, uh, pre, uh, prenatally to Suboxone? No, no, babies do just fine. Um, a lot of the studies initially were done on methadone, now they're done on Suboxone. Um, we have lots of friends. Dr. Cresta Jones is an addiction doctor who does OB at the University of Minnesota. She walked us through our first delivery, or first prenatal thing to, on that exact thing. Babies on Suboxone, when they're born, um, tend to have less days in the hospital and less chance of withdrawal than even babies on methadone, and for sure babies on heroin still. Um, the few we've delivered have not needed morphine or any type of treatment. They hang out in our hospital, we hang out with them, and they go home, again, without child protection involvement. Mr. Chair? Uh, just really short, please. <laughs> No, she's, she's from Little Falls. Like, we have to love Senator Kiffmeyer. <laughs> we love her, but she's uh, burning the clock. So go ahead, Senator Kiffmeyer. <laughs> I think I got two more seconds on that one. Uh, well, Dr. Bell, Dr. Devine as well, I um, really appreciate that. But, you know, when you, I heard from Hennepin, this is really, really important. We've talked before. We've got to get upstream. Yeah. And when you're able to do these things, and so they don't need that and they can do that, Folks, that is crucial, absolutely crucial. And so um, I'm glad to hear you're in 44 counties, but I think this is money well spent by us, and especially the savings actually look like we're gaining savings for once in something that we're spending, so thank well, that you. Well, that's actually where we started was Dr. in Bell. Morrison County tapering pills, and we had 100,000 pills coming out of one pharmacy a month in Little Falls, which now we're down to like 40,000. I mean, we've cut it over in half, so we go way upstream to the pills, so again, fewer people get addicted. And thank you. You know the, the story. Thank you, Dr. Bell. You know, Senator Rosen, uh, just listening, this actually has been productive testimony mm -hmm. in the Very aggregate, much. especially especially with the last couple of testifiers. Um, you might consider, as we just go forward on line 1126, talk about early intervention. Uh, if we put money into the, the pot of people needing services is just a big pot. But if we did something on the early intervention side, that would that's where nobody has money for that. So anyway, with... Um, with that, I think, and Senator Eaton, why don't you, do you want to offer the final closing comment, please? Thank you. I'd like to, I'd just like to say that I have had some people ask why I am supporting half of this money going to child protection. And I think it's been very well spelled out here today why. Um, I think that if we can get help to the people with addiction, that they will be able to keep their children in their homes and the children won't be neglected. This is a disease like any other disease. If somebody has cancer and can't care for their children, we don't usually haul them off into child protection. And I'm, I'm hoping that this money will decrease that occurrence. I think that, um, I think we're gonna do a lot of good. And Thank I don't, you. unfortunately, this 20 million isn't even isn't enough to cover Hennepin County for one year, but. But I, and I think 10 million going into early intervention might actually could make a big a difference, yes. So it's, I wish we had more time to discuss this. And to the people that came with all your many concerns and hopes and what you wish for this and what you wish for this not to be, uh, that discussion is still open. Um, so Senator Rosen uh, would renew her motion that Senate File 751 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services, Finance and Policy. Everybody understand that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed?
Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very Mr. much, Chair. Sir. Thank you very much. A, this members. was a good stop, Senator yeah. Rosen. Senator Rosen, this was a good stop. This yeah. was productive yeah. coming here. Thank you for that. So Senator Hoffman moves uh, Senate file 1796. It's the recodification. I thought he could just read it to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I, I think I want to start with uh, a, a bill for the act relating to children. No, it's real simple. It's a fix based upon the, the fact that Governor's Task Force on Protection of Children recommended changes to certain statutory definitions, as well as doing an organized revision of the Minnesota Statute 626.556. What you have is the recodification in front of you, and it's no substantive changes, just aligns things up, and I believe it's like looking at your kitchen cupboards. It starts to put the beans in with the beans and the and the soups with the soups, so. That's very good. And I'm told we can't move this bill today because it's only introduced today. So we're gonna be uh, doing all our testimony on this and explanations and then uh, laying it over and then acting on it Monday. Yep. Is anybody in the committee that uh, would like to talk about this, not related to child protection? Um, anybody, uh, so. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Benson. I just ask council to um, inform that there is no new language in here. We did this with Ms. Cavanaugh when we did a realignment of the marriage and family therapy statutes. So I'm not picking on you, but it just gives everybody comfort. This is a lot and it's hard for us to manage cross references. And so if you could help us understand if there's any new policy in here. Mr. Housewell. None. <clears throat> oh, the department? Yeah, why don't you just come down and say that? Oh, this, this came from the department. Our staff did not do this. Okay. Ms. Summerfeld, you get to come down and I know you missed the last bill, but here's one you couldn't escape. So, and this is going to the Judiciary Committee eventually, but not today, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jennifer Summerfeld from the Department of Human Services. The department and um, a handful of county attorneys worked on this over the course of a couple of years with the revisor's office, and it is simply a reorganization. Um, we didn't make any substantive changes. We were very careful about working through that so that we didn't have anything in there. and went through it with a fine tooth comb probably a dozen times to make sure nothing could be substantive in people's interpretation of it. And so the things you like in there are still there, the things you don't like in there are still in there. There are things we still <laughs> occasionally think should be revised in there. Would have been um, too but handy, but... We did okay. not do that in this bill. Right. Any questions? So, Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. I, I don't know. I thought I explained it pretty good when I talked about the kitchen cupboards and lining up the soups with the soups <laughs> and the... So... <clears throat> okay. <Forget> it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think we're good. Okay, with that, the bill is laid over. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Hayden, uh, right on time for your presentation. So the funny part of this bill is it has to go to judiciary. So Senator Hayden moves Senate file 730 uh, be before us. Welcome to the committee. And well, Senator Hayden, you. you have a half hour for this and whatever conversation you get into. So Chair, welcome to the really committee. Appreciate, uh, the committee Actually, you have time. About 32 minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senate File uh, 730, um, the African American <laughs> Preservation Act um, is a direct response to the crisis of disproportionality that we have in the child protection system when it comes to African American children. Uh, this bill will protect the best interests of African American children, and promote the stability and security of African American families by establishing a minimum standard to prevent arbitrary and unnecessary removal of African American children and their families. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, by the way, of uh, just some statistics, uh, African American children are over three times more likely than their white counterparts to be reported to child protection. Uh, the incidence statewide of children assessed by child protection amongst white children is 13.6 per thousand compared to 42.7 thousand for African American children. Per thousand, I guess I should say. In the face of, uh, of this, African American children of two or more races are removed from their home at a rate of 3.1 uh, and 4.8 times higher uh, than their white counterparts. Once maltreatment has been sustained, white families uh, with more, uh, um, with the same or more egregious allegations, uh, they're more likely to receive services that allow their children to remain in the home while African American children are removed from theirs. 60% of cases involving African American children are assigned to family investigative paths for discretionary reasons compared to 39% for white children. The family investigation tract is more punitive. It involves...
Um, the, the family gets straight based care is more punitive and involves the court and places of maltreatment finding in African American par parents. Uh, this finding causes a loss of employment, housing, and increases family likelihood. Um, the rights of African American parents are terminated at higher rates. African American children of two or more races uh, are between three and five times more likely than white children um, uh, who, to, to become a state ward. Um, today, Mr. Chair, we have Hennepin County uh, Commissioner Angela Connolly. Uh, she represents the area that I uh, uh, live in, and we are uh, proud of her. She is uh, fairly new on the county board, but is very well steeped in this issue. And we also are going to have a small presentation, uh, so we know that there is a lot of testifiers in time uh, from Khalees Houston from Village Arms, who really has been the citizen uh, um, activist who has really worked in this system and has helped to bring uh, this to fruition. And Senator Hidden, to the testifiers, you have the, the balance of the time is yours, and this is going to go to judiciary, and then it will come back to us because okay. it's got money. So, okay. uh, so you can there's, we can cover details you don't get to later. But I'm okay. glad you can be here, and I'm glad there's ample time. So, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I am Angela Conley uh, from Hennepin County, Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee in support of SF 730, the African American Family Preservation Act. Today I speak on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties in supporting efforts to address the disproportionate out-of-home placement of black children and the splitting up of black families. Black children and families involved in child protection are in crisis. We are in need of intervention, and that means guidance from the state through this bill. We can no longer allow the foundation of the black family to be disrupted and destroyed by the often unnecessary separation of black children from their families. There is no denying or minimizing the high incidence of our black children being placed in foster care. Counties recognize this situation. In Hennepin and Ramsey counties and in counties across the state, child well-being services are a work in progress when it comes to addressing these disparities. While some progress has been made, there certainly has not been enough. Black children and their families cannot wait for changes to be made piecemeal. Black communities, my community, embrace the movement to bring into our state law clear evidence of purpose and intent to address the elements in our child protection system that neglect the well-being of black children and that further deplete and traumatize black families that may, struggle, that may be struggling with parental challenges and are certainly doing so under the added impact of racial discrimination. If indeed our child protection system is about supporting family, about providing child safety, about addressing barriers that prevent families from building on strengths, about engaging extended families and a child's broader community when parents are not able to adequately parent, then we need to acknowledge the shortcomings of our current system and take bold steps in supporting black families as this bill does. Does. This bill is a strong expression of the author's commitment to systemic change. Thank you, Senator Hayden. Counties, including Hennepin and Ramsey counties, where the state's majority of black families live, share that commitment. We are working with the bill's authors to continue to find the best solutions to creating and implementing change. Counties in Minnesota work at the discretion of the state of the Department of Human Services to deliver and manage child well-being services. Our directors, our case managers are on the front lines working with our families and our communities. We have a unique perspective on how systemic change can enhance our goals to better provide service to black families. Senator Hayden and members of the committee, you can count on counties to work with you as this bill is refined. We are committed to improving our system and performance because black children and families are equally valued members of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and, and Senator Hayden. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to 
say that uh, Commissioner Connolly does have a, uh, an engagement that she has to leave at 4.15. So if there were questions of her, yeah, I just wouldn't questions. want her to leave and members had questions of her. Any questions for the commissioner? Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate thank coming. You. And so if, you. if you're on a ditch, I would do that so you can get out of here early. <laughs> but you're welcome to stay and I'll, we can come anytime. Thank I'll you very much. Time. And, thank you. And good luck in your duty as you have a very important job ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Senator Hayden. Okay. So Welcome. I know we're pressed for time. I do want to give this issue. Yeah, it's a decades-long so, so issue. Your name for the record. Yep, I am. I am. This is a decades-long issue. Um, we have parents and families that have been impacted by this issue. It's very important. So I know we're tight for time, but I do want to give them respect in this issue, the respect that it deserves. My name is Khalees Houston. I'm founder of Village Arms. It's a Christ-centered nonprofit that I started to aid and assist African-American families impacted by child protection. And as we go over the information here, you'll see why I use the term impacted. I also chair the NAACP's Child Protection Committee. I started that committee. Actually, it's the only one in the, the uh, country to address the issue of racial disproportionality and the uh, structural racism and discriminatory practices that exist within the system. So um, thank you. And I'll speed through the data. I just really want to kind of highlight the inequities that exist within the system for African-American families at every point of contact. This is a long-standing national issue. Um, in 2016, we were 23 percent of the um, um, entire child welfare population, although we only made up 14 percent of the total U.S. population. And unfortunately, Minnesota's child welfare data is pretty consistent with the national trend. And again, disparities exist for us at every point of contact with child protection, beginning with the reports. Every school in the Minneapolis School District over-reports black children to child protection, um, except for one. And the only difference at that school is that there is a black social worker there. And just to give an example of that disproportionality, there was one school that had a 16 percent African-American child population. They made 145 calls to child protection. 130 of those were on African-American children. This over-reporting leads to a greater likelihood that our cases will be screened in and that we'll be assigned to the investigation track. That investigation track is more punitive. It invo involves court and a maltreatment finding. Oftentimes that maltreatment finding leads to a loss of employment and subsequently housing. So we're actually creating this cycle of future child protection involvement with the over-reporting and the, um, the um, disproportionate screening in. Ms. Houston, do you think that Injecting a social worker somewhere upstream is that important? It seems like in the last Dr. Bell was here and talked about that with their work up in Morrison County. Um, is that we, I mean, is this is it something that simple? You think it seems like that's kind of a cool idea. If, it, if you noticed in one district where they had a culturally capable uh, social worker, that that made a difference. I'm just provoked by that. So well. Are we Hennepin County, yeah, Hennepin County now does um, some training to address the overreporting of black children, and I go out yeah. with their trainers. I had a black social worker tell me that the teachers there and the other social workers go around her to call child protection. So if she says no, don't call child protection, it's not a CP issue. They go around her and. No, I really like that. So I'm, I'm that's provocative. Thank you. Keep going. Yeah, I, I, I sure will. Um, so the cases that are being called in on us, 60% um, of them are being assigned to family investigation for discretionary reasons. So there's either discretionary um, reasons or mandatory reasons. Mandatory would include physical abuse or sexual abuse. Ours are discretionary. So it's just subjective. It's up to the, the decision of the person taking the phone call. It's not an actual case of abuse. Once maltreatment has substantiated, white families are more likely to receive their services that allow the children to remain in the home while our children are placed in out-of-home placement. Um, African-American children are over uh, 3.1 times higher than white children to be placed in out-of-home placement, and children of two or more races 4.8 times higher. And the significance about the two or more races category is that over 50 percent of the children in that category have a black parent. So always pay attention to that when you're listening to child protection folks talk about the number of children in placement and care, um, it's actually much higher for African-American children than what's at face value. We actually have very low um, 
low percentages of physical abuse or sexual abuse against our children. Um, in 2014, after Eric Dean's death, there was um, an influx of people at the Capitol, um, here at hearings, everyone wanted to do something. The result of that was a 50% increase in out-of-home placement, um, but it's been primarily black and native children that have been removed from their homes as a result of this. African-American parents are um, between three and five times more likely to have their parental rights terminated. And this isn't because they've abused their kids. This is primarily because they haven't worked through the case plan as um, the social worker has laid out for them. Um, they couldn't kick their addiction within the six to 12 month timeline um, and their rights are terminated. We have a lot of children languishing in foster care. It is absolutely important and um, vital that we're going back to look at the parents of the kids that, are, that have had over 20 and 30 placements in foster care over a span of years to see if that parent has um, really addressed the issue that brought the case in and if we can reunify the children. And I'm saying that because everything that's in the African American Family Preservation Act is based on the disparities that exist within the system, it's based on my research, it's based on my time and the courts as a guardian ad litem, as well as my direct care at Hennepin County Central Intake Shelter, which is the first stop for children just removed from their parents. In 2017, of the 1,600 children placed in care, 616 were African American and 407 in the two or more racist category in Hennepin County. In Ramsey County, of the 1,566 children, 590 were African American and 294 in the two or more racist category. So it's very urgent. Um, until those numbers change, um, we're going to keep coming here and, and at the counties and wherever else we need to be to get some sort of real solutions in place. Um, African American children, in addition, are the highest population moving from child protection to juvenile detention. So the school to prison pipeline exists, but there's also a foster care to prison pipeline exists. And a lot of sex traffickers actually uh, target the foster care population for victims. And if we look at, and as we will, I'm going to let um, Amelia Frank come in to kind of talk about the outcomes of foster care. Um, we're doing it wrong here in Minnesota, and that's what we want to highlight for you today. Thanks, uh, Ms. Frank Meyer. Mr. Chair, could I ask Senator a question? Rump. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I noticed in reading over the bill, one of the things that we have excluded is the uh, issue of people, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or gregarious harm. And what I, I guess my question is, if we exclude that, what, what is the main reason for, for placement, especially among American Af uh, African American children? I mean, it's if, if the whole idea between child protection is focused on safety of the child, and we exclude those particular categories, what is it we're focusing on? Because that's very disturbing to me that there's that, that there, there'd be that large a group that did not involve that. So what is what does it involve? What creates this? need for placement. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I can answer. Um, Senator Ralph, so the primary cause of child protection involvement across races is so-called neglect, and this could mean anything from inadequate food, clothing, or shelter. Neglect is a statute that we should really look at around kind of reframing the language there because we're placing families that have a lack of resources on the same track and in the same boat as a mother who left her infant in the car overnight or at home alone. Um, so the primary cause is so-called um, neglect. What we're really hoping to do in the conversations that we're having with the county is that we start to deter these families that are not abusing their children to community services and supports, um, their church family and community, the faith-based um, uh, nonprofits that are out here to help, opposed to sending them down this very punitive track that we call child protection. That's really it's interesting. disturbing to me as well. Yeah. So. So maybe having somebody capable upstream who understands the culture and just even common sense um, would help neglect to be defined more properly and not just a little whisper of it, because they need some better parenting skills. And then, so let's work on I This is helpful. Or, or Mr. Hayden, Ch yeah. So Mr. Chair, I think that, you know, parenting skills can, I think we know what we, we all think that that means that can be somewhat subjective. You know, I will also say that poverty um, clearly has an issue um, in this. So that it could be that a parent is unable uh, to, to, they don't have food at the end of the month, or they may not have the ability to 
wash their children's clothes or other things start to play into what someone else's norms are and what they think they should be able to do versus what they are. I'll give you a quick example. Senator Champion practices as part of law, and he says this a lot, where he had a case in which a person got a medical neglect case because the child was being intubated, or the, the physician um, called because the child was being intubated and had severe asthma. As they backed up the case you know, over time, what they figured out was the mother was precariously housed, often homeless, often living with relatives, living in places in which children with that level of asthma should not probably be because of mites, mice, and other things that are triggers where they probably should have been is in a stable place that had a wood floor that can be clean. And we have a lot of medical folks around here that knows that those wouldn't be the triggers, right? So our ability to spend some money up front to try to figure out how to get them in stable housing would have staved off all of the track that they went down yeah. to try to say that this was medical neglect. No, I, that's, yeah, I, I think we're agreeing. I just, yeah, that's helpful though. So. Uh, Welcome to the committee. We'll give you a chance to say something. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, the senator had a question. Uh, go ahead, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, w w what I heard you say was because of neglect. Uh, to me, that's a symptom. Why is there neglect? And then keep going. You're not going to find the root by just stopping at a symptom. You have got to keep asking the question. So why is there neglect? then why is there that, so on and so forth. What is it that is that driver? And I don't know, too often I'm hearing in all these bills, we're treating much more of symptoms and dealing with the symptoms and not getting at, you know, what is it amongst these uh, entities? And by the way, poverty, yes, poor, poor and poverty, those kinds of things. But I don't want to judge all those people may be poor and doing a really good job. Poor doesn't mean you're doing a bad job, and I think they can get a bad rap from all this because sometimes you're poor on the way to getting better. But I just want to be careful that we don't put that judgment upon them. But I think also going farther, that's kind of the upstream conversation. Senator Abler, of, um, that I think gets a little bit frustrating because all we just keep dealing with is the downstream stuff and we're not, not going back to it. Question is, what studies have been done that do dig, do go back further as to where is this, where is the dip, the depth of it that we can get to, and stop some of this. And I think when we had Dr. Bell before, um, the effectiveness of what she was doing. Okay, can we do more of that? Thank you. The so, problem. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Ms. Houston. I was just going to say the problem is that we're always looking for evident, evidence based practices. Um, but we haven't done the necessary work around reducing disparities for the African American community specifically. We have community-based practice that has worked in other communities of color. Um, one option would be culturally specific investigations and assessments at the onset of the case so that we're deterring families before they get involved with child protection and connecting them to those needed community resources. But I agree we shouldn't be um, treating symptoms. But the problem with the catch-all statute that I'm, I'm speaking of um, is that you can place anything there. Rena R Moran talks um, often about a family that was involved with child protection because when they came to the home, the mother didn't have covers on the fan in the living room, so her children were removed from her care. Things of that sort. <clears throat> so not actual abuse, but just this kind of um, subjective um, discrimination that we're, we've been... Um, uh, victim to. Thank you. So, uh, uh, do you go by? Is it your yep. Frank Meyer? Is that your? Oh, welcome, yeah. Ms. Hello. Frank Meyer. Welcome to the table. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Amelia Frank Meyer, and I represent Alia, which is a national nonprofit located in St. Paul. Alia is dedicated to transforming the child welfare system to ensure that all children can live safely with someone who they know and love or to whom they are related. Um, I have been asked today to talk to you about the impact of separating children from caregivers. And I want to talk through that briefly and then talk with you about a social return on investment study that we have just published in the last few days that talk about the return on investment of out of home care. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that all children come literally physically 
tethered to another human being, and you are all walking around with proof of that tethering um, if you wanted to, to check to verify. Um, this tethering is essential to human survival. It is a, a representative of a lifelong need for connection. And so because humans are incredibly vulnerably born, um, they are looking immediately for a connection or a protector. And they know if they don't have one from the second they're born that their risk of survival are greatly diminished. This means that being with our primary attachment, with our family, is not just a nice thing, but is actually essential to our survival. And when humans are not able to keep that bond intact, they go into survival brain, which means that they turn to themselves as the only person who can protect them. And the translation of that is that they will struggle lifelong to trust other humans. They will struggle lifelong in relationships. It will impact their ability to partner, to parent, to be employed, to regulate their emotions forever. And it doesn't matter uh, if that separation is brief or long term, the impact is lifelong. The research on this uh, is letting us know that the impact to these children of separation from their family is intergenerational. Up to seven generations forward, we see the negative impacts of removal from families. I'm hoping that all of you know about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which lays out the criteria for abuse and neglect that happens when we are young, and then predicts future predictive harm, including in your health outcomes and in your longevity. Uh, what it, the ACEs study showed is that 67% of US adults suffer from adverse childhood experiences or early childhood trauma. Um, this trauma, those 10 ACEs that are measured, one of them is removal from your parents. And so when we remove children from their home, when we separate families, we actually create one of the 10 most important traumas in a person's life that we are trying desperately to avoid. Emerging research, research is showing us that children who remain home, even in neglected and abusive environments, fare better than those brought in to foster care. I'm gonna say it one more time because I think it's shocking. According to Doyle 2007 and a number of other studies which I could prevent, uh, provide to you, there are early indicators that children who remain home in abusive and neglective environments fare better than those who come into foster care. Why in the world would that be? It is because one attachment to your family, even though it's poor quality, even if bad, is better than five, 10, or 20 different caregiver attachments. That really does a number on children uh, long, long into their lives. And so really thinking about um, removal as, as something that we do as last resort, as something, severing those relational bonds is something that we treat as a sacred option. So we do that as, as little as as possible. Um, and we, we really are approaching the work in our nationwide transformation of child welfare to ask the question, what do we need to do to keep families safely together? And that is where our investment must be. It's not in the treatment of children. It's not in the removal of children. It's keeping families safely together. We recently published a social return on investment study which showed that on virtually every indicator available, Children have worse outcomes when they come into care. In fact, for every dollar we spend on out-of-home care, when foster care is done well, we lose $3.64. If we do foster care how we typically do it in a typical scenario, the loss is $9.55 for every dollar invested. Out-of-home care in this country is a $29.9 billion proposition. You heard the numbers in Hennepin County alone having doubled in the last few years. We are talking 150 million. Add the multiplier of negative 9.55 to it for the societal cost, the cost to all of us, and the cost that shows up in additional 
helpers in uh, schools because your kids aren't getting the attention they need and they need to hire additional aides for kids who've got that trauma, who have that loss and that separation. The additional cost to your property property tax, the additional cost to um, incarceration, to our homeless population, to housing, it is all tied directly back to this childhood trauma. And what we know more than anything else is that keeping families safely together is the primary way to prevent that. And we're not really clear yet exactly how to do that safely. There are lots of pilots and lots of things we're doing, but what we know for sure is the negative impact of removal will have lifelong intergenerational consequences and requires that we do everything we can to keep families with their people, children with their families, in their communities, in their cultural context. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hayden, you have one more, that's really interesting. Do you have, do you have one more testifier? Yeah, uh, well, Mr. Chair, I think we had one more, and I know some others had contacted your office, so I'm not sure. Well, you've got about, well, and so, um, it, it's 426, how long do you want to stay? But, uh, so, um, this is what's going to happen. Uh, we haven't really spent much time actually talking about your bill. Uh, we've had a really enlightening discussion about disparities, which I think is extremely productive as a preamble. And so maybe uh, with respect to your testifiers, if you could just kind of have somebody go over like the highlights of the bill. And sure. then um, this is, uh, I'm surprised that there's not more testifiers who have concerns about this bill because it's, it's, uh, it's a very, um, well, provocative, uh, aggressive bill, which I actually kind of like a lot of parts of it. And so I just want to announce to the people who are watching this, this is a legitimate effort that I like a lot of. I have not studied every detail and some of the things need some work, I think. Um, and there'd be a lot of opinions, but uh, it's not a drill. This is a, we have two years to work on this, and so I'm interested in finding a way to address the very things you've talked about. So I just want to make sure yeah, the advocates are like, gonna come talk to you and say, oh, what about this, and, all right? Well, well thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will say this, I'm gonna have uh, Ms. Houston kind of go through um, the bill, and I, because I really want to highlight some of the great work she's done. I will say this, we have had a lot of conversation. Um, we are talking to the counties, as you uh, have seen, all of the associations. We've had meetings with our, our largest two counties, because that's kind of where most of the African American kids have reside, um, and we're in ongoing discussions with them. We've had um, several conversations, or at least a couple, with uh, DHS and the folks there about some of the uh, ways that they think about this. Um, so we are behind the scenes having a conversation, as well as uh, Representative Moran, the chair over there, is carrying the bill. So we're having these conversations in the community, trying to figure out what is the best way and really addressing some of the concerns um, that people may have. I think out of the... Um, the, the, the grace and the, and the privilege, um, we wanted to be able to present the bill kind of as is. Of course, members can do uh, what they please and ask any questions that they want, but I do want to reassure the members of this committee uh, that this conversation, of course, with some of the substantive changes in the, in, in the statute, um, we are having a conversation. As a matter of fact, on Friday, I'm having a conversation with the county attorney folks and, and others. So, like, as this gets out, and I think as people see that it is potentially moving, we are open and available and having uh, those conversations with all stakeholders, including the community, which is really where this bill came from. Right. And Senator Bingham has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hayden, and I appreciate that because uh, I, too, share some of these uh, concerns. And so I would... Um, be more than happy to, to partner up with you and um, uh, when we have more time and talk with you a little bit about that and be part of any meetings that um, you feel would be um, a benefit to. As, as you know, I, I work for child protection um, and so I um, want to be a resource and help uh, and partner with you on this. So. Um, be happy to help in any way I can. Well, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator. Thank you, uh, Senator. We certainly uh, are looking for all the help that we get. This is an all hands on deck uh, type of situation, but we, 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 um, we, we have been. I think. We have spent a lot of time even to this point, and we'll continue uh, working with uh, Representative Moran um, as a kind of a team to try to right size this and get this uh, where people feel comfortable. Thanks, and Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Hayden. Uh, when I take a look at what's up above us there, that is a really great statement, a really good statement. I, I think there are so many good things there. However, as I read through the language of the bill, I have a lot of concerns. And so uh, I would want to stay focused 
on that goal. And um, but I, I have a lot of concerns. And I just thought, considering what's been said here and some of the things you're doing, I just needed to to let folks know that I, while I laud the goal, I have real concerns about some of the language of this bill or quite Senator a bit. Senator Benson. Um, Mr. Chair, the path, this will go to judiciary, and then what other stops do we think? Uh, that back to here. Back well, to here. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm almost sure, not that I'm trying to make Senator this bill longer, but uh, Mr. Chair, I think that it, it's got to stop over in uh, Senator Kiffmeyer's. There's a console that's in there as well, so I... <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I know that we have that journey judiciary, um, Senator Kiffmeyer's committee, uh, and then ultimately back to you, uh, right. uh, Mr. Chair. So I know that it, it has and, a bit of a journey. And All right. Mr. Chair, and Senator, Senator Hayden, we are creating a child and well-being department in human services that might hit the general operation. So I just, I want to be there's a lot of work to do. I share some of Senator Kiffmeyer's concerns. So if we move it out of here today, I think there's going to be a lot of eyes. Uh, there's one provision where we say, the court shall order a local service, social service agency to immediately and appropriately uh, to provide appropriate, meaningful in-home family services. That in and of itself is going to make judiciary crazy. And if they leave it, it's going to be really expensive. So I'm just trying to, trying to be realistic for the people who are listening and don't necessarily engage in all the minutia of legislative policy. There's a lot of things to be vetted out. The goals, as Senator Kiffmeyer said, are laudable. Anyway, so um, let me express, so what, what we've accomplished today, and this is, if we discuss, what's, what's this committee? Is it policy? Is it finance? What is it? And so I think the very nature of this committee, Senator Hayden, actually favors you today. This is like a first reading, an airing of the topic. It's out in public. We had a great crowd attend, some really quality witnesses. More could be said. Um, and, but to flesh out the details, it would really have to come back or even in a policy mode and then deal with the money part. But we're going to send you off to judiciary, which is going to be the harder buzzsaw anyway. Uh, and they'll, they'll answer some of the questions that we would have brought up. But I think the decision that we have to ask today, are we happy with the system we have relative to African Americans? And how are we happy with how it's working? Do we want to bring forward an idea to make a change? And based on that, I'm very happy to vote to move this along uh, into the, to keep you moving, to keep your community engaged, keep the counties and all of the uh, advocates engaged. This is very important work. And if we do well, we'll have something that would be really good to look back on. And so, uh, well, anybody else? Senator Bigham, and then we're going to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just for clarification, because I'm new. -er. Um, so the, the primary jurisdiction of this bill, I guess, uh, or the crux of it would be in judiciary, which is why we're moving it out to judiciary versus, say, keep. Well, so if this were, if this were only the policy committee, we're a policy and finance committee, and so we have quite a bit of flexibility. If this were the policy committee, we'd say, well, we're going to go and break and come back and spend three hours tonight and amend this and have more testimony and maybe be here till midnight working on this thing. Got it. And so, I mean, that's what you would do if that was, the, if that was our only shot at it. We could not send it off without it being prepared. So we have had the oversight, the, 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 the preamble part, and beginning to scrutinize the content. And so it's going to go to judiciary, and they'll have a some work on it there. Eventually, it's going to go, come back here for both the policy discussion and a financial discussion. Can we afford to pay for whatever it is? And Senator Hayden, as you bring it through the process, it'd be nice to know what parts cost money and what are simply policy. And that's my, so going forward. So. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that that's uh, important work. You know, there's this kind of a series of bills that we had a re reunification yeah. that the champion had later. We'll hopefully have this uh, issue around foster care and licensing. So it's kind of a series of bills that really yeah. affect this community that we hope would work together. And in addition to that, there is a lot of ongoing conversations about what the stakeholders, com holistic stakeholders, community, DHS and the counties that implement this, as well as the judiciary uh, or, the, or the judicial branch, which, which kind of orders these uh, issues. We're having conversations with all of those stakeholders. So I think by the time we get back, you know, uh, God bless that we get through uh, judiciary and as we go to uh, Senator Kiffmeyer's to make sure that our uh, task force and others are in order, I think you'll see something that then when we start to 
to, to really delve into what this committee does, which, you know, of course, you're the chair and I'm the lead at, so I re really uh, think it's important that I think we'll have a product uh, that what hopefully we can, we can get over the finish line. And Senator Hayden, has this been heard in the House yet? Uh, it was heard yesterday in an informational way. They wanted to get a lot of the testimony. They spent a couple of hours or more yesterday talking with the testimony. Uh, it is my understanding Representative Moran wants to bring uh, the bill back and then start to move it forward. Yeah, and that's good. And so, um, but I'm trying to give you legs is what I'm trying yes, to sir. do. And Thank so, you. I appreciate and so, uh, that. This, it, it, it burdens me. And so I'm hoping we can get something done. So um, any other questions? Okay, with that, Senator Hayden uh, removes his, renews his motion that Senate file 730 be recommended to pass, but make sure it comes back here, um, and be sent to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, everybody understand that? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very nice members. hearing. Thank you to the Thank testifiers, you. and God bless you all. And with that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Yes.